Okay, let me see. Well, let's start. Um, good morning, the people on this side of the oceans. Good evening, the people back home. Our conversation today is by the one and only Akini Ochin. She's awesome. Um, it's about exploring complexity of sexuality. Uh, Akini, Anza. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me again on the authentic dialogue platform. It's a pleasure to join you for another session around sexuality conversations, which I really love. Uh, let me just do a quick introduction about me. I, I call myself a culture shaper or a catalyst because I really love having conversation that people don't like having and pushing the narrative into a different world kind of view. And in my history is I started sex education in primary school, funny years, but I actually did. You know, I was those children who were in the straight talk clubs. I don't even know whether straight talk still exists, but I was that girl. And this year I've been um, fortunate enough to have been awarded an award by ASSET uh, in digital sex education. I'm a mentor to young girls through various platforms, but the key one is gearing up program and global park circle. I'm a tea enthusiast and um, uh, basically love tea. And I will ask everyone to join me in my cup of tea. I'll show my cup later. And just for fun bit is I live with hyperdrosis, which is sweatiness of my hands. So if during this session you see me take a break to wipe my hands, it's the hyperhidrosis. So as we start this, I'd like parents who are watching this, um, anywhere you are in, just to really reflect on what does this topic, complexity of sexuality mean for you? Or what kind of question does it trigger or what does it bring up when you just hear um, uh, complexity of sexuality, right? And as I was reflecting on this topic today and this presentation, I, I, I took a step back uh, because it's always good to do a step back and it makes it easier for you then to have richer dialogue by having uh, trying to marry the current uh, um, what do you call it space and conversation to to where you came from and so you, you realize that our history when we're growing up sex talk was mortifying yes for majority um, a very huge number of homesteads and parents but it was simple it was simple in that the only thing we were talking around sexuality was don't do it outside marriage. Uh, it's because it's enriched, it's God and Allah and traditional view of sex in marriage, uh, which is really pro, pro, pro abstinence. Uh, it was more of a, a scenario of don't ask, don't tell. So there was really little asking around sex. Uh, so it made the conversations very simple. And of course, when we look at the current space we are in, we are in that space where now even the number of people who talk about safe sex practice uh, is very minimal because abstinence is now very laughable, right? Uh, even among the generation not think that really can laugh at it, they, they literally laugh at it. I have actually been laughed at in communities where I was talking to teenagers and they were like, condoms, what are those? Like, which generation do you come from? So we are in that kind of space. Now, when we look at sexuality generally, it's not just around sex itself, and that's the assumption that we all make, but it's really about the body, the mind, the heart, the environment. So it's about the values, it's about communications, it's about self-image, it's about socialization, how you express yourself, personality, body image. Then all these factors bring around, now you marry it with sex and our sexual choices and our sexual preferences, then that makes the complex world of sexuality. So in short, being a sexually healthy person means that you can express your sexuality in ways that are not harmful to yourself or to anyone else. And, and I just repeat that it's not harmful to yourself or to anyone else. Unfortunately, most of the times we've twisted this freedom into meaning that I can literally just do anything. Huh? Uh, and, and we've twisted sexual freedom to literally mean you can do anything without caring for even yourself or anyone else. And so those are bits of the complexity around sexuality. And as I've just highlighted, it's we have the mind, the heart, and the body. And when you look at these pictorial presentations, is that there's one side that is very dry, and there's a division in between. There's, there's a very green land. Uh, so 
having sexuality conversation is in the hope that we stay in that green land, both our mind, heart, and body is more towards greenness than towards dryness. And so in terms of identity, it's really about who you are, what you think of yourself, the quality skills, challenges, all this bring it together. The knowledge is about what do you know? So what do you know about sexuality? What do you know about sexual expression? What do you know about sexual freedom? What do you know about sexual choices? What do you understand about sexual consequences? Right? And then the questions around sexuality. So for example, uh, 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 children start from the simple one, which is usually the conception of a baby. So how is a baby born is usually one of the simplest questions. But in overall, it's about what are all our curiosities around sexuality, that is in terms of the knowledge. And so part of the mind is, as a part of sexuality is then how do you express yourself, sex healthy sexual expression? How do you make decision? How do you behave with the others? How do you assert yourself when the ideas are different from those of your friends? Uh, so that is basically looking at sexuality from the mind perspective. Okay. And all these factors, one way or the other, play how we make sexual preferences and sexual choices. And the other is the heart, which is the emotional needs. And I have demonstrated a picture of a little girl carrying a, a plant that is sprouting and needs to plant it. And so emotions are very key in response to sexuality. And the reason why a lot of sexuality uh, discussion is around emotions is because most of the time human beings make decision not based on logic, but based on their emotions. Then they bring in logic to justify their emotional choices. And so because emotions are reactions that we often do, even as adults. So whether it's an adolescent, whether it's a teenager, their first bearing of making decision is around their emotional needs, okay? Or the feelings that they want to feel. And so it's an important dialogue that we cannot divorce from when we talk about sexuality, because it's about love, to be loved, to give or receive affection. It's about the feelings and the emotions. It's about expressing this and mastering how to manage, uh, because there's no good or bad emotions. Emotions are simply emotions. It's us who label them as bad or good. Uh, when I feel anger, I feel frustrated, I feel infatuated, I feel happy, I feel excited. All those are just what emotions are and it's what we do with them that really makes them good or bad. And the body is about really appreciating your body. So you are a sexual being, uh, you will evolve sexually from adolescence into young uh, adulthood. So how do you accept the diversity of bodies, the uniqueness of your body or your similarity and differences? And there are a lot of people who suffer from ident self-identity crisis. Uh, uh, stemming from low self-esteem and what this means is that it literally even affects how we step into relationship because you step into relationship from the point of lacking the point of low self-worth and it's also reflecting on what is your body needs uh, so how does we for example in this space where we're talking about children uh, start helping them to reflect on one how how do they handle crushes which is a, a feeling that is coming so even when it becomes that they really have those sexual um, urges, but we know they're not ready and equipped to have them, then how do we help them handle such? How do they generally take care of their body, protect it, respect it, and ensure privacy? All this is around the conversations around the body. And then of course, there's the bits of which I'll, I'll jump into, which is the part of uh, the environment. And the environment here is now what helps you thrive in as a sexual being. So this can be familial or the environmental influences. So familial here is within the home space, the, or within the school space, which is also more of familial. Uh, what is the kind of relationship that happens within that space? How do we relate? How do we have consent boundaries? External environment really here is the bigger players are in terms of the culture that we live in. Huh? which really affects us and, and or the religion affects what we do, affects our perspective, uh, some knowingly or some unknowingly. And of course, it's generally about the values we bring in the relationship. All these dynamics is all surrounding sexuality. So again, another reflection I want us to do is 
are your perspective based on a Christian or a religious viewpoint? And religion here can be uh, Buddhism, Muslim, Hindu, whichever religious view you are in, or is it a human rights based viewpoint? Why are we bringing these differences either? These are the two major uh, pull and tags around sexuality conversations because their theories and their principles are very, uh, very diverse. And it's, it's what makes us have middle ground very, very tricky. And each of its reflection points both has merit and demerits on its own. But really as an individual is, you're reflecting on this because reflecting on where you stand helps you to have the necessary conversation. It also allows you to know I'm coming into this space from this viewpoint. It helps you to try and also see how you can best come in uh, without a lot of judgment or demonizing or criminalizing uh, the other person's viewpoint. And because you're talking about sexuality and the complexity around it, we cannot go without having this dialogue. Now, when we look at the competing views of the human person, and I, I've put them in quotes, the reason why I've put them in quotes is they're not absolute, but they are more of what they think. So for instance, we know most of our Christian views are based on our theology and uh, that has existed and a culture that has we've lived in for a very long time, but we've really not had science to help us prove that Christian view. And when we come to the dominant, which is sometimes we call it the secular view, or people, other people call it the human rights view, it really also, they bring in the aspect of this is how it makes sense for us from this particular angle. Uh, very minimal research has been done around this. And, and, um, and so it's whatever research has done, you can say it's, when you are researchers, you say it's of small significance. And, and the research is also because healthy research is you do research pro and against just to identify, but whatever minimal research that has been done, then cannot help us say this is a hundred percent argument on view. So that is why we've put them in quotes. Now, the dominant or the secular view, as we know it, it's frequently presumed to be the proven because they tend to take a science approach and argument uh, around conversations around sexuality. So that the ones who made that step at least to try and prove to bring in science, even if it is of some minimal significance around it. And so they, the, how they stand their view is I am my mind. So I am my mind here is whatever I've made up in my mind. Uh, I can literally just have the choices because it is me living in my mind. They're also based on this view that I am self-defining being. So self-defining being here is uh, I decide what it means to be me. I have no given nature to direct or limit my free choices, right? So they, are f they, they say they're free as birds and can fly and make whatever choice they want to make. And then my body is an amazing machine which I'm entitled to use as I please, right? So they are like, it is me, I own me, and I can literally use it how I please it. There's no other plan for life other than the one I make. And then of course, there's a view of, I am free to determine my own identity. So I will not be put in a box. I will not be put in a box of what people think I need to be, all right? And then of course they are, because they define their own identity, then they believe the identity is what gives them their freedom of autonomy, right? Now, mostly we put the, okay, so the, the two LGBTQE, it's the, the terms continuously evolve, EI. The term continuously evolves and it's not important for us to master all the entire list to read because the reality is it, it will continue evolving. Even next year we'll have another term added to it. So basically that what we call the, the dominant view or the human rights based kind of view. Now, when I come back to the Christian view, which is heterosexual. So this is the view of um, male, female, husband, male, uh, female. Uh, it's a male and female kind of relationship. So it's rooted in scripture and Christ, our Christian view I've put it in quotes, but you can literally put in another religion, which also has almost a similar view. So that it's Muslim, Islam, you can put that and it's almost similar view and replace God here with Allah, 
right? It's rooted in scripture, tradition, and the church teachings, okay? It defines you not as the mind, but it defines you as the soul and the body. So we know the biblical view teaches us that we are created uh, for God uh, as God image, and we need to have a standing around that. It's you are the creature. So your nature is you are a human person as an inter in intentional gift of God, who is for good and loved by God, and to that existence, and you need to practice certain laws around that kind of life. And then my body is designed by God and helps me to understand God's plan for my life, all right? And the primary identity is that you're the son and daughter of God. So that is who you are. And therefore the choices you make are reflecting on that kind of views. So this is where most of the, us as Africans have centered us around uh, the religious view, uh, basically, because even in our own traditional routines, it was it still had elements of religion, even they were old uh, traditional routine. Now, when we look at the human identity of evolution, because in the Christian view, religious view, let me call it religious view, we only had male and female, and that was the only term that existed. So all these other terms have as come as we've evolved. So now we have different terms around the identity evolution. So we have the term sex, we have the term gender, we have the term sexual orientation, we have the term gender identity. All these are evolutions within identity of our sexuality. So biological sex here is this physiological status of the male or female, which this still maintains as our Christian view. So primary, you possess either that of male or female. We have one or two people who have intersex, which is still biological in that they are born with that condition. Now, gender has evolved not to be male or female, but basically to be the psychological, societal, and cultural definition of masculinity or femininity. So it's how, what we define those uh, factors to be that has made it male or male, uh, male roles, females role. So in terms of gender roles, it has also evolved with time. We've seen a, a marriage of even um, like we have the alpha female. So there's a kind of evolution also around that. And we are seeing terms like gender is also now becoming new. Now, when we look at biological sex, which is how we are born, and that the, the choice of who I want to be. We are seeing an evolution where now people are making choices of even changing how they want to be. So I can be male and I change how I want to be, whether it's female or male. And we've seen a rise of this, especially in developed countries. Probably we are lucky or unlucky, whichever term you want to put it, whichever shoes you wear, in that in Africa, our uh, healthcare is very expensive and not, mostly not covered by insurance. And so most of the people have not started doing this. When you look at studies, we see that the rise in, into up to 10% of, of children going through puberty changing their sexes. So it's a real shift, right? Uh, and so some of the uh, typical development here is sex assignment, which is really the decision to bring up a child with ambiguous uh, genital, um, genitalia, either as male or female. Uh, and so they can decide to be assigned one. Intersex here, which is a natural condition where you are you either possess both and you literally need treatment to go through, to undergo one or two, all right? Now, when we look at another evolution, and this I'm still talking about the evolutional theories is, uh, our religious view, which was more of based on the natural selection of male and male and female, where we look at male mates, female mates, that was the dynamics around it. Male and female mating theory was our natural evolution theory. But now we are in this evolution where we have diversified. So everything else has been brought on the table, but we still have our culture that is working with us, for majority of us, especially in the African spaces and have brought us into really shifting world or eruption or volcanoes, as you may call it. Now, the, the science-based view of 
sexuality, when you look at determinants of sexual orientation, as they talk about it, so they talk about one, hormones, two, brain structure, three, the genetic influences, four, environmental influence, and five, childhood experience. And I've put a mark under genetic influences because as I started, I say, whatever research that has been done is very minimal for us to really make conclusive decisions that this is what it really is, one. Two, is even where genetic factors are, we know that most of the time, anything evolving genetics, the percentage is really very minimal. Even diseases that are caused by genetics, the percentage of that is usually very minimal, all right? Uh, so as the science people try to bring this into table, this is just a reflection that also this may be a very minimal player. So it leaves us with the four key conversations around hormones, which is still um, slightly scientific environment, brain structure, environment influences at childhood experiences. Now, the reason why it's also better for us to understand this concept as we navigate this conversation is, and this is the truth in that experiences influence our sexual preferences and choices. Our environment has a big play in how we choose our sexuality. So it is very right that number four and five play very big steps in the kind of choices and in the kind of the influences that we choose as adults. Oh no, as even from adolescence as we progress, because basically in adolescence, a child is, the body is becoming like that of sexually, that of an adult, uh, because they're getting ready to make babies. So the same way we have sexual experiences in our own world, it is the same way they have sexual experiences in their own world, right? Now, does it really matter the conversations we are rounding around sexuality? And I've brought in some of the key issues that we talk about. And the reason why we must reflect on this is we can't have a sober conversation if we don't have, if we don't understand the context around it. We can't have sober conversation in the spaces we are having if we just shut it down and say, you know what? Those are the nonsense of the Western world. We will not talk about it. Your children are in spaces where when I open TV, the first thing my children see on cartoon is what? All kinds of relationships. So that means even the uh, LGBTQ kind of relationship is shown just as the heterosexual relationship is shown. And it's therefore a dialogue that you cannot escape because they hear, they see, they watch. And if we don't speak about it, they're going to make decisions around it based on their own experiences and not really by us helping us navigate that. And that is why we need to understand all these dynamics, even as we speak, regardless of which stand you are, right? Now, others, why there's a lot of debate around this issue is, and children, and the people who may ask is, why am I gay or why is my friend gay? Why are they different from us? Is the big debate really is the big debate around whether people are born gay versus sexual fluidity. Now, we know that sexual attraction is considered to be the state of art or way that they've used to quantify sexual orientation. But what really brings in the gap is also in terms of is it really genetic or this, these are just preferences and choices that people are making. Uh, so when we talk of an identity, ideally, an identity is something that ought to not have been changed, but this term has really changed. So is it more of a preference or an identity? And the fights around it is even in terms of, we see women attraction arousal between the fluidity. So then that means, even when we bring the, the point of, are they born gay, is really very debatable. Now, nature versus nurture. Is it nature or are they nurturing? So nurturing here is where we speak about environments, that are created that continuously, that is the kind of the relationship that children consume or we consume. So we are nurturing it and it's not really natural. Uh, the conversation and debate is also around, it's not natural, it's not born because we've also seen transformed same sex people who exist because if it was natural, then they won't exist, right? It's um, some think of it that can it be a genetic conditions but then again, the, the sexual orientation is not a medical condition, right? Now, the argument around hormones, which some of the scientific people bring forward, 
is that there's some changes in the intrauterine environment after birth that really makes one then brain, looks at the brain, and then that makes them move towards that, right? But then we also see around that, that there's a big dialogue around the social environment and the family environment and the life events and the experiences. And experiences here has a lot of underlining because there's a lot of, we've seen a lot of choices being made because maybe people experienced abuse traumas, like sexual abuse traumas that have really inclined people towards certain uh, sexual choices, or even in terms of how we talk about the other gender and makes us want to choose. For example, I instant, I know, and I've experienced this, where teenagers told, tell me, you know what? Men are dogs, men are shit. Now, if we're in an environment where the conversation that we've had of the other gender is very toxic, then, then that, what the children only see is the toxicity of that gender, then they make the choices based on their lived experiences, right? So these are part of how our environment shape our conversation. The environment here is also a child who walks into school. They may have never had a conversation around what relationship is at their homes, but when they walk into school, the kind of relationship that they see is that of around the same sex. So what happens is they pick that because that is then the world they've stepped into. That is also an environmental factor. Now, the other environmental factors is because during adolescence, children experience sexual changes. And unfortunately, our school systems is such that children only stay in the same sex kind of schools. And what this translates into is that as I'm feeling an attraction during my phase of adolescence, stage, uh, then the only people I see are the people of my same gender. So I get a roast or I get attracted because I'm having sexual experiences, even in this phase I'm having, but the only people I'm seeing are the people I look like. So that can still be part of how the environment really contributes to this. Now, this child who is constantly in a boarding school, also now, let's translate it, they also walk into home environments where it's really, there's no dialogue or interaction with the other gender completely, right? Uh, because you cannot be seen with boys. Boys will make you pregnant. You cannot talk with anyone. They will do this ETC. Now, the life, because this child is experiencing and how the brain works sexually is, they'll still experience those arousal. But then the people they only see that bring in and can link are the people of similar gender. So that is also another bit of, how really our environment contribute into our sexual choices. Now, the interesting thing is, and if we reflect, if parents were seated here, if we reflect it back to when we were growing up, even those eight times, there were still, we could hear rumors of same sex relationship, even within schools, but they were not as open as they are now, and people would hide it, but they were still there in our boarding schools. And we even have spaces where some of us were being, uh, what do we call it, dragged with, I, let me use the term dragged, with paraffin in our foods so that our sexual feelings were submerged. Those are some of the experiences we had. And it was really still that phase of environment. Sometimes also our choices of sexual peaks is about trial and excitement. So I've had there's a face, I've had this, this thing, new thing. So there's the formal in it. So a study done by the American Psychological Association shows that the number of even uh, children who also try the same sex relationship, not many of them in adolescence phase turn out to be gay because for them, some of them may be their trial. There's the formal. So the formal, the excitement, they want to try it, they want to feel it, they want to see how that bring in. So all those dialogues bring a lot of conversations around behavior, sexual behavior, sexual attraction, sexual ar arousal. But now because we've literally bring, brought in the term sexual fluidity, so it gives um, the human rights concept and therefore it brings a lot of debate around, but I can be sexual fluid. I can literally just say today I'm trying it out with male, tomorrow I'm trying it out with female, 
tomorrow I'm doing in between mix. And it's a whole dialogue around that, right? Now, you can continue putting in your questions on chat even as I continue to do this. Uh, so some of this, I was still just still looking at the argument that we bring in, uh, whether it's in terms of the human behavior results, uh, which I've talked about the genetics, the interuterine, I've really talked about on the brain development, or the familial and environmental influences. The psychological here are the traumas that children experiences that makes them choose one. So I may, I may have such a nasty experience that when I see the other gender, it's really, I can't. So then my choice is inclined to something else, right? Or the person who really taught me about what love is was really somebody of the totally, or maybe the same gender that really understood me more than the other. And this still contribute to our sexual choices. Now, our conservative arguments, because you also have to bring it on the table, because we have both pro and against, is that we really weight more on theories and, and, and the theological perspectives and less on scientific evidence. So this is also a challenge to those people who are in this space to try and bring it more science so that we have a richer dialogue around it. But my biggest question now, because we are in a world where this is the reality, and this is what I tell people. It doesn't matter how many law we say that will ban same-sex relationships. The thing is, it's already out of the pot. And so it is something that will be there. But then the thing is, how do I as a parent bring in my values, my choices? How do I have conversations around it without looking like the demon that we sometimes look at? So the first question I'd like to ask the parents who are in this space, and you don't need to answer, but you can literally do a reflection now on yourself is, uh, what space have you created in your own environment for children to talk around romantic relationships or feelings pre-engagement? So here pre-engagement is, have you created a space where your child can talk about how they want to start dating before they even start? Have you created a space where your child can talk about the choices of relationship they're stepping into or who they believe in or what are their views about dating before you even start? Because some of these conversations, we need to have them with children before they step in. As I told you, the environment is sometimes one of the environmental thing because children now tend to be aligned to their uh, peers is they'll step in and what they see the other peers do. And because they don't have a stand around it, they'll quickly pick it. Uh, so the biggest question is, have we created those spaces in our home where we can have conversations around relationships before those relationships happen. Because that means then that we guide our children into the kind of work and path that we really believe in, we really have our values and grounded around. But we also bring it in with a lot of respect around it. Because the reality is uh, that the rights-based view is not going anywhere. So this was also just what I was trying to explain about the rights and the non-rights, and we've talked about it in the earlier, uh, what do you call it, the earlier slides. Now, sexuality of teenagers is, even as much as some of us have rules around dating, which is you date at 18, but we still need to have conversations because adolescents experience fantasies, they experience desires, and they need to de develop a belief system or an attitude system uh, that is value-based, that helps them navigate their sexual relationship whether they will have it post 18, okay? For those parents who even allowed, started allowing their children to date in their teenage, teenage years, what does the boundary look like for the practices and the choices that they make around it? And we need to have a conversation and dialogue around that, okay? So I want you for a minute to reflect how does your family feel about one, sexual orientation, where here it is either you are pro-heterosexual or you are the human-based rights where you feel people have freedom of choice to do anything they want. Now, if you put it to the world that people have the freedom to choose anything they want, what does that mean for your own family and family and how do you navigate around it? How do you help your child make healthy choices even as they navigate through that, right? Uh, what are your views as a family around gender diversity? So are you a family who are like, you know what? We have very strict male, this is what males do very strict about it. Female, this is a very female around it. Or 
we can allow a marriage in between? Is it that home that can allow a child to change gender if they want or not? And reflect and write because help write reflecting and writing helps you to step into the conversation with a lot of knowing where I stand and knowing how to do it. Yeah. General is also another one you can reflect, but it's important to reflect on those three because even as we talk about this, you will, you will bring in uh, your kind of stand and perspective and angle towards it. Now, when we look at adolescent sexual behavior, it's basically, it's progressive. Most of the time, as I said, it's an explore, exploratory mode. So there's a lot of trials to do it. And that's why it's very important for us to empower them so that the, the trials, even if they think they want to do trials, they really are informed around what healthy sexuality is, okay? Sometimes it's also just sporadic behaviors, not always planned. They also learn and model around people around them. And there's a lot of experiments that adolescents do, okay? Now, when you look at this graph, it really just tries to summarize what really motivates sexual behavior. Uh, so for me, really, the biggest definition for me, it really is not even a lot of focus around this, but for me is to focus on the gaps that I've identified as an educator on the ground, where children literally yearn to have conversations around relationships, but unfortunately, the only conversations we have with our children is ends with what is menstruation changes, if we ever had, and we don't talk about how uh, the evolution, even into friendships, into relationship, into choices. We assume our children are too young in, in early ages even to start conversations around um, uh, thinking about around sexuality. We also have spaces where, because in adolescence, children experience sexual crushes, which is very normal. But then if we don't help them manage it, because just because I experience a sexual feeling doesn't mean I need to act on it. And crushes are really just like, they're like blows of candles. Uh, so they may not all translate into the things that I really need to, to reflect on sexually, but I, I still need to be empowered that it is normal and I can handle it this way. So parents are not having a dialogue. For me, that is the biggest gap. And so they leave children to try out trial and errors. But then come up when children now have already made their choices, then start grounding children on, on those choices they've made instead of really standing in and helping children to have uh, um, the, the thinking, the critical thinking before they step into those spaces. And so the challenge really for this as understanding the complexity is to help us understand how we can best help our children. And the best way we can help them is to have pre-conversations uh, so that they walk in and they have grounds. They know this is my choice. I choose this because it means one, two, three, four for me. And it's not the other way. I, I, if I want a relationship, I will have it with one, two, three. I will not do any trials because for me, this is why my stand is, and this is why I, I choose a certain path. Two is uh, coming also from the space of facts in that these children see and watch. Because now, even when we look at things like Netflix, I, you can count the number of Netflix shows that don't have sexual um, orientation conversation. You can literally even count, even cartoons now have sexual orientations, conversations. And so it's, we can't hide into that part because the conversation is happening without us. So it's really also talking about the reflection of what we watch and our stand. And, and most of the time parents ask this is, how do I have this conversation? And it's really bringing it into this perspective is one, Acknowledging what facts is, is that, yes, this is what is happening. This is the transition around the world. Two, acknowledging that they have, people have very different worldviews. But for really us as a parents of the space I come from, my worldview is one, two, three. So your worldview, maybe you support it or you don't support it. But acknowledge things like, like this exist. Ask your children what it means from their own viewpoint. because. When you start the dialogue of asking, have you heard about LGBT? What does it mean for you? What do you understand? By the way, these children even know those terms that you know them. You'll be surprised when you go ask them. They literally tell you from the two to the I and define all of them. 
And so, because they have friends who talk about it, who express, who do all these things, it is to actually also give them that space where they can come and tell you and talk about, this is what I know about it. Uh, this is what I've heard about it. What are your feelings? What are your thoughts? What are, are if do you have friends who share this, this, how do you feel? How do you do this? Because then it helps you as a parent to help your child from an informed position. When you just come, I don't want to do this, then that child will unlikely ever express or tell you one, two, three, because you've already shut down that door. So leave the door to having sexuality conversation very open so that the, your child will allow you in so that you walk with them that journey. Engage them into critical thinking before they even start talking about relationships. So start talking about dating before your child dates. Even if your rule in the house is dating is at 18, but your child needs to understand why are we picking 18 as an age for us to date? And how, what does healthy relationship looks like from our angle? What does it mean? What does love mean from that angle? And have cautious conversations. They're not children. They're having these dialogues in those spaces whether we like it or not. And it is up to us to help them walk, step into those spaces uh, with really some grounding and some framework because they will talk with friends, friends, schools, friends, that is where they spend a big chunk of their life. So they're going to have this conversation, but when they step in, when they have something and they have some grounding, they're also able to influence how the dialogue continues and the dialogue is. Uh, so basically, that is basically how, for me, is looking at it in terms of all the complexity arises. It is not in terms of fear. This was just I was trying to share. Um, as, uh, it was this was on the American uh, Publishers Association on uh, sexuality orientation among young people, which I've already shared. And it's yes, create that space, and and create a space where your child asks you questions around sexuality, where you have dialogues around. What is relationship? What is dating? What is healthy? What is not? What does intimacy look like in relationship? It doesn't mean you are promoting them, but having that critical thinking and helping them reflect really helps them also reflect and have conversations around it, right? So that they can even disclose if they, they, if they are starting to have feelings. Because sometimes, as we've said, is adolescents, may, you may feel, but you don't necessarily act. You may feel because you are in an environment that that happens. But then as a parent, you want to walk into that with your child in a space that is very informed around it, those conversations. So finding that balance as we almost come to the end of this is that we need to, there really is, we can't say we'll ever find 100% balance because the views are very diverse. So the human rights view versus the religious view are very kind of been opposite right because one is grounded on freedom the other one is grounded on theology and that's what guides us now summary and repetition because i've spoken about it but it's important for me to emphasize is speak to children what they know about the subject even if you don't know how to do it you can just start by what do you know what have you had uh what do you see because they see they watch even when they sit on those movies uh, well, these are the world views. These are the trends in the world, but what is the differences in our space? If you have differences in your space, how do I view it? And then don't be afraid to share your perspective. Parents, never be afraid to share that this is why my choices are very different and this is my stance. Uh, because children, they Google. So these facts they know, but most of the time they come to us with sexuality conversations because they really want to understand our perspective. So don't be afraid to bring in that perspective into the room, never shy off. And it, it doesn't mean you are bad because you have a different perspective from what the other person has. It really is a perspective. And inclusivity here is we both have to bring in our different perspective. So bring it to the room with the, the whole, the entire confidence you have. It's your perspective and it's very okay. Let's create a safe environment where children can talk to us about sex. I walked, let me share this. I walked into a high school where the main reason I was called was because the percentage of the same sex relationship in that school was very high. Over 80% of the girls were practicing same sex relationship. Yes, high school in Kenya, yes. Not an international school, no, 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 it's not international. And when I talked to the girls, 
and I asked, who is that person you can talk to about sexuality when you walk home? Because around, a, a lot of conversations around sexuality, schools will give the basic anatomy, biology, but the values, the attitudes that we bring in, the perspectives are grounded on values, which is very diverse. So a school cannot bring in the value element unless it's a universal value, like don't kill. They will talk about those universal values, but then the values that we bring in as families, we need to speak about it to this, to this when we talk about sexuality, because then this is what grounds our children. When we talk about the whys, what is the value that makes us talk about it? So the why is not just don't have same-sex relationship if we are that parent. Why are we reflecting? Why are we having a different perspective to not having same-sex relationship? What does that mean? And why are we choosing that stand? What is, so go back to the why till you reach the almost final why into why you are saying that and start the conversation with the children around that so that they understand why we are making certain choices. If you are pro, also talk, talk about why you support. Why do you think you support or why do you think you're against it? Have a dialogue, whichever stand you make as a parent, where, whether you are a conservative or right-based. Because then the challenge is we leave a lot of challenge to schools to handle the situations. Most of the time what the schools will bring is they will bring in the rules where the rules for them is of course, no relationship in school. So that is what the rule that they lose. But you see saying no relationship in school has not stopped the experiences, the fantasies, the, the, the infatuation that goes on. So the rule has just done a slight molding, but it has not really helped that child navigate how they need to step out. Uh, so they can still hide, they can still sneak whichever space is in and have this relationship. So it's not hiding, it's giving them that space where they can speak to. The challenge is we overburden school. So a school that has over, 500 girls, each girl's bringing in different perspective. It's difficult. So it's easier for them to just say, this is our rule. But you see, as a parent will be happy, oh, that's cool, Don't, that won't allow those things. They just say no and cut. But that doesn't really help our children because our children will not stay in schools forever. They will walk out. And what happens once they walk out of school? We need to empower them to be critical thinkers and to be critical people who make decisions because they have identified them as them. And when we empower them enough, it will be very difficult for them to be swayed by others because they really understand who they are, why they're making certain choices, why they understand the why to read and they understand why for me, you are my friend, it doesn't matter what your choice is, but I really don't have to do what you do because for me, this is why I'm doing it. So they've started understanding it from very early ages, all right? Now, the other point that I want to speak to, and I know my time is almost over, is around disclosures. So disclosure here is, it may be a child has chosen a path, regardless of why they've chosen it, right? Whether it's environment, all those factors we talk about, but they've chosen and they've said, they've, most of the time they don't admit it to parents because parents are so harsh. So they would admit it at school. The school is usually the first place to identify that they've made such a choice. Now, the school sometimes find it difficult to have, with, to have this conversation with parents because when parents are told, the first time is they shut the door. No, 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 my child can't. And the door is completely shut and a dialogue cannot happen. But as a parent is, if disclosure happens, what do you do as a parent? Is first, take a deep breath. Whatever feelings you're feeling are valid and it's very okay to have whatever feelings you're having. Uh, because it's about re your reactions around what you think is right and what is the choices that are made. So just take a deep breath and acknowledge that my, my feelings are valid. We are not invalidating them. But after taking that breather, we bring openness to this conversation. And why we are saying bring openness is just because you told your child, this cannot work out in my house. That child can simply just quiet. But when they've walked out, they will do what they've chosen. Okay? So it's really trying to understand why have they made those choices? I usually tell parents, so for instance, if your child would walk to you and tell you, I am interested in a certain boy and they're a girl, what will you do as a parent? Or a boy comes and tells you, I'm interested in a certain girl, what will you do as a parent? The first thing is you ask why. You try to understand why they've chosen this person. And hopefully at this stage, you will be having that parent who's talking around what healthy relationships are, what boundaries 
it entails how do you protect yourself even in the dating world because most of the time children and we've created this narrative that dating is the same as sleeping partners which is very off dating is dating knowing person it's not the same as sleeping with people you go on dates with but we've married the two so it's having that dialogue around that okay so that you don't slam the door you try to understand huh? because if you slam that door that conversation will will end but you will not be able to get to the root of what made them have the choice okay now even when that decision is difficult and you're still in that space just acknowledge that you still love your child which is very important it's still your child. Give yourself space if you need to, to reflect further. You can, you can literally just admit that this is very different for me and I need some reflection to do and come back to it when you're sober, not very angry to talk about it. I've talked about engage their critical thinking to understand why. Bring in, as we said, your perspective. And it's still, you bring it because you're bringing it in with love. So avoid condemnation by bringing your perspective it's important to bring in your perspectives around issues around sexuality. And that's why I always say, sexuality conversation for children does not just start with children. It literally starts with adults working on themselves because we need to understand ourselves, understand what it means, how all these things are, and to bring it into that dialogue. If you need to revisit that conversation, feel free to revisit. If that child you feel has chosen that path because maybe of certain things that they need support, get them that support that they need but try not to just do what, slam that door. Allow your child to journey in as they reflect that, whichever choice of a relationship that they choose, whether it's opposite sex, whether it's same sex, give them that space that you can have a critical thinking around it. And remind, we have to be parents who talk around sexuality, talk around uh, what boundaries is, talk around what sex means, uh, even as they start progressing and they get older, talk, out, talk around consequences to sex. And the consequence is not only don't get pregnant because now children can access P2, children can access abortion of the clinic. So they will not do no, all means of not getting pregnant. Children are practicing anal sex because parents have said don't have sex. Uh, so anal sex will not make them pregnant. But then the other consequences of the emotional impact of having sex, you are missing out on it. The social impact of having sex, we are missing out on that. Uh, other uh, physical impacts like STI, ST, STDs, we are not talking about it. So we are not bringing fear to conversation, but having a rich dialogue around to help our children navigate their sexuality world. And please let's not leave this dialogue to schools. Schools will just put a blanket through and that does not help our children. So I come to the end of with this and, and allow Saya to guide us to the question, but this is me, Emilio Cheng, Tintok Table. You can take a screenshot of that if you need to, and then I can stop the share and bring Saya. Yes. In case anyone is wondering, Saya is my brother. Uh, we oh, yeah. hold conversations on. Sunday. This is a different for <laughs> which uh, um, uh, uh, Akini has been on before. Um, so let me ask you. So, so in um, Maswali and Meisha, because uh, I talk to my children about it, but are we having these conversations in school? Are you being invited in to have this talk? Now. So the, the, the challenging bit around it is schools are not really putting priority to sexuality conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, they give priority to career um, talks. Now, the few schools who talk, call me are more of the international schools, I guess because they have in the curriculum, they need to talk about sex education. So it's mandatory for them. Huh? And so just to bring, or they talk about other aspects of inclusivity and children talk around about their sexuality openly in school. So they they more inclined to call me than our Kenyan system schools. Uh, very few have called me Kenyan system school. And most of them when they call, it's because they are in crisis. So, and the most crisis is the sexual orientation where they just, um, 
for example, now because that is in girls' schools, uh, who mostly do this is like a number of um, a major number of girls of just same sex. We know of maybe, and this parent seated here, I don't want to mention the name of the school, but we know of a school in Nairobi where it is literally known that if your child is called, people will be like, that school, the same sex school. So it's, it's, but we are not having that. For me, the frustration as an educator is I walk into those spaces and I see children who really want informed information, but they're not getting it. So they're, live, they're left into the world of what is the internet telling us? What is Netflix telling us? Uh, whether those narratives that Netflix shows is right or wrong. What is uh, pornography telling us? And nowadays, pornography is just not the, the porn hub you go to, but really pornography is from TikTok uh, to Instagram. They have games that they play in. Uh, they tell me those, the sim kind of simulations that they have. So when you look at town children, town children have come into this space with a lot of exposure and a majority have a lot of sensitivity sensitizations around sexuality, which is also very different from uh, rural areas. For rural areas, their exposure is not so much around the sensualization, but more of them come into early sexual onset because maybe they're trying to have sex for something. So for them, most of the time, sex is an exchange for something. And like the town children where they're really sensualized because of the spaces that they're in. And there's also a lot of FOMO around adolescence in that I'm the one missing out. I'm, all my girlfriends are having, experiencing. Eh? We are, the, the, nowadays it's the, the, the term that most girls embrace because it is most girls who embrace sexual fluidity than boys. Eh? Most boys will say that gay, but girls are the ones who embrace the sexual fluidity is their sexual fluid. So we can try girls today, we can try boys the other time. And for boys, we also have spaces where they're even coerced into those relationships. And because they really don't know anything, they don't know who to speak to, then they've been coerced and they, they, they start that because of that coercion and everything. So speaking to them helps them go into those spaces when they're really informed, especially if our children are in boarding schools, uh, where I've talked about that as an environmental factor. And it really is. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, that's how our school system designed it. Uh, it would have been better if we have had more of the mixed sex schools, but unfortunately, that's how we are. So we have to deal with it. And dealing with it is allowing our children to talk about it. Kindly parents allow your children to expose and interact with different genders. It doesn't sexualize them. Talk about rules of dating, okay? Whether it's 18, talk about you can only talk, you can only watch movies, but allow, or we will do it under supervision here is, I can go sit down in a corner somewhere, you go the other corner, but we are still together. Allow interaction so that children also are exposed to different kind of people. And let's also, even as we demonize one particular gender because of maybe our sexual experience, let's not over demonize it so that then the only narrative a child is having is a very toxic narrative around what the other gender is, yes. So, so let me ask you, so the, the, the reason there's a rise in um, same-sex experimentation, especially on the female, is it anything to do with the crowding in schools on top of TikTok and, and environment and everything? Because we, we this is a PB forum, it was an all-girls school. And apart from one or two um, cases that we had of, of uh, and there were rumors of, of, of people actually experimenting, um, it wasn't as rampant as it is now, or are we just exaggerating the situation? No, it's really because what has happened was long time ago, the sexual people's sexual experiences was more hidden. So even when you are doing heterosexual things, it was hidden because remember, sex was supposed we were supposed to be pure. There was the purity culture one, two. There was the culture of sex for marriage. So you are stealing. So all these sexual experiences you are stealing. So you will not go and post around it. But now we've stepped into the world of hello, sexual freedom, right? It is my body. I have the choice. And we are in spaces where even adults say this and we say, and I'm not saying we don't have to have sexual freedom, huh? but we are saying it. And the way we are saying it, our children are also absorbing huh? issues around sexual freedom. So sexual freedom is here 
and everybody is like, no, I can literally just engage. Yeah? And we've not, we, no, we are not even talking around um, laws of consent. And by the way, by the Kenyan law, sexual consent can only be given at the age of 18. There are actually children who've been arrested because they had sex before 18 and the other gender walked out and said they were harassed. So it is very important for us to talk, tell our children that legally, any person having sex before 18 is doing it at their own risk. Because the Children's Sexual Act Offenses Act says the only age is at 18. So that can literally spill in. But because we live in, there's no fear. And because the consequences then was we were afraid of pregnancy, things like that. But now we have ways of dealing with such issues. We believe we have such. So we've become more open, we can express ourselves. Then the internet has brought in the dialogue widely. So we are seeing all of us. Uh, children are seeing news, but as parents, we are scared of talking about it. So for example, there was this opportunity of Uganda really around the debate, an opportunity to talk about what really that means, what that perspective means in our homes. Even here in Kenya, where we've even had uh, um, conversations around it, but we hide it. And what happens is our children are having those conversations in schools as we hide it. Uh, so just because you don't speak about something doesn't mean they're not speaking, they're speaking because when they go to school, they are living the experiences of all the other people. And so the all the other people, even if you don't give your child a phone, huh? the friends have phones, your child has a phone by extension, by the way. And uh, so it's, 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 it's talking to them around these issues and not just covering them. We've seen now the other country that has come up is Ghana. So Ghana is going to really be all over the news around and the LGBTQ issues, these are opportunities that as parents you can take to really have dialogue and conversations around this. So children see it happen. And for them is, I found is some, some of them even now try to join in support because they think their friends being victimized. So they're like, why are adults so emotive? Why are adults speaking with so much hate? And because they're, they're saying these are our friends, then they try to bring in the angle now of even supporting. You get the point? Uh, so they're not supporting some of them because they have aligned to that, but they're supporting because they believe others are having so much hate and these are their friends. And so it's, it's us to have those healthy dialogue because for me, the, my strangest, my frustration as an educator is I walk into those places and I know the, the challenge we've given to schools is not a school challenge. It is our challenge as parents to really breast this and have these thoughts. And unfortunately, very minimal schools invite us to, to just have conversations around health and sexuality. Ah, yeah. Wapenzi wa tamzamaji ama wasikilizaji, do you have questions? Cynthia, Emma, Nash. I don't know who Nash is. Do you have any questions? Not questions, but uh, just to say thank you. I think that was so informative. I have enjoyed the talk and very timely for our society now. Thank you so much for the good work. Aribo. Cynthia, ukona jambo la kusema. No question as such, but uh, thank you. It's always a good reminder for us to remember that, uh, especially our own kids as, are not as innocent as we think they are in terms of what they're exposed to. Uh, I think sometimes we turn a blind eye as parents as to what they already are exposed to. So thank you for the reminder that these conversations need to be ongoing. Um, as little as we can, as much as we can, but ongoing, keep them flowing. Thank you. Nash, you have no choice but to speak. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, well, I think Emily knows me, so I, I follow her mm -hmm. Facebook page, and when I saw it, I, I, I just plugged in, I think, around eight, and... Um, I think for me, it's always getting to hear this and making it so comfortable for me to speak about it. And that is why I plugged in. And um, maybe maybe just to comment on something about um, the LGBTQ+. I remember my son is 10 years old. And I remember one time we were driving back and I asked him whether he knows about it. And he actually told me the whole of it in full. And yes, they know, they know all this information. So again, when you ask them and they know, and that becomes a basis for us to start conversations around it and making it comfortable. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a point, I mean, it gave me an opportunity to 
talk about it and tell tell them about my Christian, I mean the Christian values and what is our stand as a family, so that at least they get to hear from me and not from his own peers in school. I always thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, can you want to be able to go to school? Yes, so it's um, I'm actually I'm available for any of the parents who are here if you want to do an extension and invite me over to your school. I'm very open to such dialogues and even to speak to parents who sometimes invite me because sometimes having these dialogues is a challenge for parents. So parents come into groups and invite me to come over and help them navigate through this conversation. So I am available as a support system to help you navigate the conversation in whichever space, whether it's your chama, whether it's your institution, whether it's your school, whether it's your merry-go-round, whichever space you want us to talk about sex is we can actually talk about sex. Now, before we wind up, you see this tab? I don't know how to do it. It's called Bit Awkward, Let's Talk About Sex. It literally, I, I printed this because sometimes parents ask, how do I start to talk about sex? How do I even start it? So it's one of the tools that I, I now use to give parents. And it, putting this on the table for me is, it brings different conversation because my son, my younger son, who is eight, starts from, okay, now. Now, what is this embrace sex talks? What does embrace sex talks mean? And that is still an opportunity just to have sex conversation. So what I'm trying to drive us is try to look for any opportunity that can help you have the conversations. If you need support, it is also okay as a parent just to say, I am really stuck, I need support. I, I need guidance, I need somebody to work with and get that support that you need. And hopefully we will all walk into the journey of literally creating sex positive community where we talk about healthy sexuality and not hide about it. Yes, thank you. Hallelujah. Um, thank you and for the Pibirians who are here, thank you. Um, I think our next, this, these talks are supposed to be curated for Precious Blood Riruta, but they are open to the public because we are, if we don't talk about it, who will? So next week, hopefully we'll talk about endometriosis. I know it's been a buzzword, but so many people have suffered. Periods do not have to torture you. So join us next week as we talk about it. And then on the authentic dialogue, the one, um, uh, Makini mentioned it's going to be uh, a bigger conversation in November because uh, that one I, I, I don't do PowerPoint. You have to answer my questions. Lakini Asanteni, I will send the, the recording out to um, to Akini. It's also on, on, on the Facebook page we run, so she'll share it. But if you know people who are anti meta but pro alphabet, meaning Google, they will get um, the YouTube um, video. Asanteni Sana. Na kwa herini. Usiku mwanana. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night.